I'm Stefan Bauman and welcome to the Bauman Effect number 16. Now we're going to get into the brass tacks of how to paint trees. How do we go about doing it? What is the correct way to paint a tree and how do we put them into our painting? We're also going to be discussing bird holes and sky holes and what brush that we actually use and how to use those brushes to make those fantastic trees. We're going to learn about temperature. We're going to learn about how to make awesome forms and shapes and interesting perspectives. And we're also going to learn how to make branches, the correct way of making branches so they look realistic so you never make a branch that feels out of place. So sit back and relax. Watch Bauman Effect number 16, the first of two on trees. And I'll talk to you on the other end. Like they are. The thing that's really amazing about trees is no two are alike. Everyone has its own personality, and we want to kind of pay homage to that personality. When we think about trees, and if you know anything about um, growing them and, and harvesting them and, and working with them and being with them like I do on a daily basis, not only do you see the, individually, um, you know, the individual characteristics of the tree itself, the species itself, but the tree itself sitting there on this planet planted. Um, it's surprising that they're so respectful of each other. So you don't have trees that, that uh, grow on top of each other. They tend to be just far enough and they learn to live symbolically with each other. And so we got to think about that as we start painting. We also have to think about the size and width of trees before we start, um, where they're located in the painting, how they offer eye magnets, how the trees uh, provide a sense of place, a sense of history, a sense of time. Some of these beautiful oak, these some of these beautiful pines that are in the Sierras, you know, they they establish that you know a lake that you're painting in the Sierras has been there for several hundred years just by looking at the foliage that's around them. Um, when we did uh, the National Park series, we went to Joshua Trees, we went to see the uh, the juniper trees up in the Sierras. Um, bristlecone pines. I mean, there's just so many beautiful trees. So let's kind of take a look at a way to go about painting some of them. I'm going to start off first with uh, just kind of the basic concept of, of a mass of a tree, what we think of trees are, and then kind of take them apart and we'll see. I'm going to be painting on a, a masonite board. This is a ambersant uh, 12 by 16. Uh, 12 by 16 canvases are, in my view of thinking, the foundation of what you should do. You, doing any canvases smaller than 12 by 16 um, doesn't pay the rent. It doesn't make sense. If you're going to go out and paint outdoors, paint on something that doesn't end up in a bathroom like an 8 by 10. The 12 by 16 is a, is a real decent size that when you get it on the frame, it most likely will find its way in the living room and not in a hall or in the bathroom. Unless you like painting bathroom, scenes and there's nothing wrong with that because you do have a captured audience there. It's a little wetted down hopefully so that I can wipe and do several demonstrations. We'll see how this works. So the first thing what I want to do is kind of just establish the mass. Now when we watch Bob Ross and uh, people paint trees and when I have students that first come to my classes their first incline is to paint the sky in first and then the mountains and then put the trees in on top of the sky. But with much study of artists like Moran and Bierstadt, Sargent and uh, Monet, Manet, uh, we really look at their work, we actually realize that their skies oftentimes were done at, towards the end of the painting or around a tree. So for instance, if I would paint this canvas right now all in blue, like you would see with William Alexander, or with Bob Ross. And then I put the, the foliage in on top of it. As I put the foliage in on top of it, it's going to pick up all of that blue paint. 
And so the colors are not going to be true to a tree itself. And the tree itself has a lot of variety of colors, not just the dark green. And that's probably the first thing we want to think about, is that trees are not green. They're variations of green. Um, well, they're not even variations of green. They're variations of, let's say, brown and dark blues. And towards the highlights, they're more yellow. And it's a combination of, of these colors that give us the illusion that we actually are seeing green. When we're painting the foundation for a tree, we want to kind of start thinking about it just as a mass. And so let's just kind of start there. I'm going to be taking uh, ultramarine blue. I'm going to add just a little bit of yellow to it. But I'm still going to keep it very blue. And I'm just going to start with a shape. I'm going to do the shape large enough. And I think we're going to just start off with something that looks like an oak tree, just to kind of start our conversation off here. We're going to have the highlights coming from the left-hand side. Now in Facebook, oftentimes, uh, well, I think I know the video is kind of vice versa. So it will appear that it's coming from the right-hand side, but in essence, it's on the left-hand side. I would actually go in and start painting in a sketch my trees like that. I would actually have a form and if we were to do a landscape like this I wouldn't be worried about the mountains right now and the sky and all that. I'd actually go in and start painting in forms of trees. Okay, so let's say this is a, a meadow here and I uh, have a little pathway here. Instant little landscape. Anyway, so but it's this abstract shape that we want to kind of concentrate on first. And I'm going to put in like the shadow of the tree. Now, this is going to be kind of a solid shape. And it's important when we do a landscape painting that we view the shapes as a form itself. So it's like this piece here in relationship to everything else in the painting. That's, that's the shape that we're going to have. And the reason why I'm trying to work so hard is getting a real flat surface right now. Here we go, we got a kind of a shape. Here's a shape. And it's not uncommon that if I'm not on location that I actually start laying in my painting with a paper towel. I mean, just really big, bold shapes. So I look at the overall shape. Now, you know, sometimes I look at students' work and they look like a gigantic lollipop. So they'll have a trunk down at the middle and then they'll have this balloon-like shape on top. And you kind of have to figure out that that's not what we necessarily want. But when we first teach trees and when I have students that come in, they, they first are really aware. They go, oh my God, I never noticed that trees have holes in them. So the first thing that we actually see when students are, are uh, painting trees for the first time is that they usually see this as a tree, that as a tree. When you're painting a pine tree, again, it's usually this big solid object, like a Christmas tree with no holes in it. But the reality is, is that trees have what we call sky holes. I call them bird holes. And if you don't paint them in, what happens is that you have to paint a bunch of dead birds down below because they can't get through the trees. So, but basically they're sky holes. Um, if I were to do this painting, I would be working around my trees. I'd be keeping the shape. And at that point, I know it seems kind of backwards. I'm actually going to take my sky color and I'm going to work around my, my tree. And this is just swirling blue and white. And I'm just boldly going about this. This is not going to be a great work of art. This is just a demonstration on how to do uh, sky holes and tree holes and all that. Okay, so I'd actually paint my sky around my tree. And you know, one thing that people are thinking when they're doing a beginning painting, they're thinking, oh no, you paint the sky in first and then put in the trees. It's so much easier than that. But you can see that this color here is a different color, shade, temperature than what's happening in the background sky. And so in the process of painting the, the, the sky, we paint up to where the tree is and paint around. Like that. Okay. 
then everything else that we do to this tree will be in, in reverse painting. I'm just going and getting some nice brush strokes in before I start cutting in. But what we do now is that we'll actually take the sky color and we'll actually go in and start forming the tree even more carefully. So I start cutting into the tree with the sky. Now if the background has mountains, let's put some in real quick. Oh, cobalt blue and let's just put some mountains in just so that we have a variety of what we would do if we go outdoors to paint. So here we got some mountains. They go along here. Yeah, very simplistic idea here. Although simp simple ideas painted well work very well. Okay, so we're going to take the, the mountain scene also and again we're going to bring that into the painting like that. And I'm going to be taking this color here and I'm going to visualize where do I want to put that trunk at. Let's see. Let's just put... I'm going to be putting nice thick paint there. And then I'm going to jump over here and I'm going to paint the other side of the opening. And right there, you can start seeing that would be a trunk. That would be the trunk of the tree and I imagine that going up inside there. If you're going to do like an aspen tree that's mostly a trunk and then has a few little things, you probably would not use this, this method. Um, but uh, this would be more for like an oak tree. We're going to do some pine trees kind of the same way as we go on. But uh, if it's really sparse, I wouldn't do that. But for if my trees are actually going to form a mass in the composition, and notice I've actually left a little bit down below, and that would be for uh, any bushes or anything. And I'm going to make a few more negative shapes there so that now my deer can kind of climb underneath these, these oak trees and, and hang out. Um, this also becomes kind of a shadow. Now it gets a little tricky as we get inside. Uh, one of the things that you have to do is that the next colors that go into this area, when we, and this is why when you paint the sky first and you put the tree on top, it looks really fake. Um, what you want to do is you want to lay the base color in and then put the, the base of the tree in and all that, but the, the holes that go in at this point here are going to be a half a shade to a full value darker. A lot of times what happens is in the process of doing this, um, some of the wet color will actually help do that, but we're going to take a half a value to a value darker and we're going to go in, and I'm going to very boldly for right now, this is a little darker shade, but I want you to notice that right along where the trunk would be, I'm going to go with a half a shade darker. And I'm adding just a little bit more cobalt blue to it. And also the color that I have there as a base color will also be uh, somewhat wet. So in the process of putting these bird holes in, they'll be picking up some of that color. Now, since we're close to the mountain here, we want to make sure that we have more of a purpley color as opposed to the sky color. And what's really crucial is to imagine where the trunk would be as it goes up into my tree. And what you want to do is you want to outline the outside of that trunk where it would actually show up. And you're painting around branches, so it takes a little bit of practice to do this negative painting. We're going to go in and I'm going to put in another bird hole here. These ones are going to be larger right now, just so you can kind of see what I'm doing. And I'm going to put another line in here. Um, I'm going to go just a shade lighter so you can see these. But I'm going to be working around my trunks. And I know it seems like, oh man, that's so difficult. But believe me, that's the best way to do these things. If you're going to put a spot in the middle, you've got to make sure that if you're going to put a big hole in the middle of the canvas, that it doesn't uh, counter effect where the trunk would go. Somewhere in here the trunk would go. So we're going to put in these sky holes. I kind of think of them always as bird holes because I do like the idea that live birds can fly through these. 
and I'm always taking in, I'm always thinking about a branch. Like right here, I visualize the trunk of the tree curving. Could put another hole in here. Just depending on how open you want your tree. But right now, we really want to try to get a variety of, of, of openings in a tree and try to make it more three-dimensional. Oh. And you know, you'll have bigger areas where the color will be almost the same color as the sky. And as those bird holes become smaller or the sky holes become smaller, they get a little darker in value. And again, you're always looking for where you can stick in a suggestion of a branch. I'm paying attention to my trunk of my tree and it's kind of diverted a little bit because I wasn't paying too much attention there. But as long as I can kind of see it working, and we could put some of these branches in later. I tell students when they start putting this stuff in like this, that it looks like a bunch of bags hanging off of a tree. Um, so you gotta have to get the little nuances so that they have a little bit more uh, feeling of, of being real. Um, and we do that with softening some of the edges and making the, the openings a little more interesting. Now, yeah, how, how do you learn how to do these negative shapes? Well, one of the best things that you can do is just actually sit down with a, with a pencil and paper and just draw them. Yeah, if you want to draw a limb of a tree that comes at you that's three-dimensional, you know, notice my hand right now. And, and see that, you know, you can see my hand, but my, my, my trunk, my elbow, my, my branch is actually hidden. And so you've got branches that come out at you. How do you do that? Well, you sit in front of a branch and you just start painting it. You sit in front of a tree and you start drawing it. One of the most intimate studies I ever did, one of those moments where you just go, wow, it's good to be alive, was when I was in Yosemite with a painting group and I had uh, just learned that I could take masonite boards and spray them with auto primer and get an amazing surface. And I had gotten gray auto primer on this beautiful panel and I sat in the middle of a meadow in Yosemite on a beautiful day. And my students were all scattered around and it was a time back then when, you know, I wanted my students to spend some time just being with nature and not, you know, worried about being coached. And I wanted to steal a little bit of time for myself. And I sat on that meadow with my legs crossed and that panel in my hand. And I spent about two and a half hours just studying an oak tree, one oak tree on top of this gray panel. And uh, I still have the painting. It's one of those monumental paintings that I would never sell. But that communication, that feeling of communicating with the trunk of a tree, the, the, the moss growing on the tree, the, the wonderful branches coming at you, and just really seeing how it is. I painted it in oils and it was just absolutely beautiful. And it was not unlike this here. Now, what we have to kind of keep in mind while we're doing this, and we can always go back in and you know, fill some of these in if it gets too lacy. But we have hard edges and soft edges. The hard edges are going to be the branches and the soft edges are all the foliage. And so what you want to do is if this is a branch here, you want to soften the edges a bit where the foliage meets so that it doesn't look like bags hanging off of a tree. You just kind of work out leaving the hard edges for where the branches are Soft edges where the foliage is. Some bird holes have no branches in them. And that way the color of the base of the tree is actually a different color than the sky. And this is one way that you could paint ala prima outdoors. You know, when you're painting outdoors with oils uh, and you're painting a big beautiful sky with lots of paint, you know, it's really hard to get paint to stay on there. And we would actually even do this with, uh, with pine trees also. And we'll, we'll try to do a demo for that also. Um, 
again. We can get as lacy as we want and you can start seeing where that just kind of has a nice open feeling in it. Anything that I do here, any of the bird holes that are down here, I want to make sure I use the, the color of the mountain. Make sure that that's seen through there. What's really effective, if you get really good at this, this is extra credit. I know, it's like, oh, I love trees. Okay, so extra credit here. If you notice this mountain here, see this blue sky here? See how that's different than purple? I'm not quite sure what you can actually see. So sometimes I'm really surprised when I look at these videos again, you can actually see quite a bit. But, um, so we have that mountain line. See where the purple is and where the, where the blue is there? So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take this sky color and I'm going to go into this bird hole here and I'm going to actually have mountain showing and have sky showing. And that makes the bird hole even more complicated. I know some of you are going, it's sky hole, it's sky hole. It, no, it's my painting. I can call it anything I want. Okay, so half that section there. I'm trying to go overboard so you can actually see that from here. Um, so half of, the, half of the mountain, or half that bird hole is actually sky color, half of it's mountain color. If I had more trees in there, those openings would have uh, those colors back behind that. Okay, so like I said, you can go in and periodically you can just put a few little dots here and there. Again, always kind of pay attention to where the trunk might show up. Normally when I start branches and trees, it's a, you have a tendency to want to start from the base and kind of work your way through it. Um, I find that best thing to do is working with, especially with a nice round brush. And this brush here is, uh, it's an Escada Optima, which is... <laughs> It didn't get better than this. This is really great. This is a number four Escada round. It's going to cost you about $35. The great thing about Escadas is that every brush, its handle is purposely created for that brush only. So if I buy a number six Escada round brush, chances are they re uh, make a different size handle for that particular brush, so that every size has its own and it creates a beautiful balance. Um, these are l like uh, fine instruments, surgical instruments, and you'll see why you, you kind of need it. Now, when you're working with a round brush like this, I want you to notice I'm going to be doing this. You see how I'm rolling my fingers like that? Okay. So I'm always going to try to find the tip, and it's real crucial to kind of, kind of understand that that as you, as you paint, you want to roll the brush constantly trying to find the tip. And sometimes you've got to go through two or three brushes because sometimes they work just beautifully and sometimes they don't. And oftentimes students go, I can't do those. And it's not your fault. Sometimes it's your brush. Some of my students don't even have brushes. They have sticks with metal ends with it, hard, hard tops on top. Those are sticks. You've got to have a brush that holds it. And the way that a brush works, and this is crucial, when you're doing this kind of detail, is that this area of the brush, and I wish I had a bigger round of this, but this area of the brush holds the paint. And some of the liner brushes that are longer, the main reason why they're longer is that they hold more paint. And if you look at artists that do car detailing, they have this really fat brush up here, but the points are all the same. And the, the bigger the brush, it just means that you can go further without dipping in uh, more and more paint. And so you want to have the paint fill up your brush and it's got to be loose enough so that it flows to the tip. And like I said, this brush could be gigantic and the tip could be this small. It's the only difference is I could just go on forever and ever and ever. And like an ink pen, it just constantly just pulls the ink down. So look at the bottom part of the brush as just merely a holder. The key to it is to put enough turpentine in it. Not your medium, not your liquid. This is pure turpentine. And the reason why you want turpentine is so that it flows out of the brush. It just, you know, just comes out of the brush and flows. Chances are you're working on wet paint. So in order for that to stick, you've also got to have a, a leaner consistency. The way that paint doesn't, you know, like if you're painting wet on top of wet, for those of you who want to do Alla Prima painting, 
when that doesn't work, it's because you're going like lean on top of lean or thick on top of thick. It's always best to go thick and lean or lean and thick. That way it actually sticks. So we're going to go very, very thin, lots of, turpen, lots of turpentine. I'm rolling my brush around and I'm loading my brush. Um, and this first moment is always the moment of, of, of chance because I don't quite know what this brush is going to do until I actually work so, with it. I'm looking at the painting now and I'm looking to see where I've kind of established it. Can you see that trunk? Now, a lot of artists have a tendency to want to go up into that, like that, and try to... What I like to do is I like to work from the top down. And the reason for that is because here I can kind of establish a certain size of trunk. And I'm going right back down. And as I come down, I'm going heavier and heavier. See, I'm not guessing at how big I want to go as I go up. But this is, the, I start off with the size that I want to end up at. And I can get a more interesting uh, shape if I go that way than if I try to go up the other direction. Um, this way I can kind of pay attention to where things are a little bit thicker. And then same thing in here. I'm going to put another tree in here. And I'm, see I'm rolling my brush back and forth. I'm just you know, over dramatizing it here just so you can kind of see it. But I'm actually just rolling it, always trying to find a tip. Once I get that in, I can go back into there. Um, sometimes it's, it's effective. If you notice working on this board, uh, and again, you couldn't do this with all this blue paint that you originally have in here. But if you actually kind of look as I'm going through this wet paint, I can actually pick up <laughs> some, of the, some of the color there. And look at that glow that I'm getting on that tree right there. That's just paint. Now, you probably can't see that, but believe me, that is gorgeous. That's the, the actual color. And we can go in and we can bring in some of this color with just wiping off, getting back to that main surface there. Um, that color there, that brown, that golden color, I'm using asphaltum as my, my base color. You can use transparent brown oxide or transparent red oxide. Now I'm going to go in and I'm going to bring in a few branches where I don't have them. These would be the finer ones or a continuation of the branches that I'd started off originally. Always make sure that the width of the trunk is, is wider than the top. You always want to make sure too that the brush, that the trunk, that at the base of the trunk here, that it can you know, uh, hold a tree, you know, all that foliage. And you've got to think about it also in wintertime, you know, if that could actually hold all that snow, all that weight. Um, One of the things that I'm going to be doing later on, and I'm going to be repeating this a few times, and I'm going to do this down below here. So I'm going to make sure that you get this idea. Secret to doing branches. Again, it's a lot of medium that we use to make it nice and wet. But the secret to doing branches is this. Hold the brush. You can hold it this way or this way. I'm going to hold it for now. I'm going to hold it this way. Now remember, when you hold it this way, you're working more with your subconscious mind. So but when I start, I will start off with a, with a branch. And I, sometimes what I do is I work backwards. So I'm going to start with the base part of the tree here going out. But I could do this backwards too. But just so that we kind of understand is that the way the trees grow is that they grow in seasons. So they, season one, they grow this way. Season two, they grow this way. And every season, they stop growing. And usually what happens is that when they start up again, they usually change angles. So oftentimes these angles that we see in here are the trees actually going dormant and then they come alive again. Sometimes during winter their little tops snap off and there's another branch that goes off. So the way that I find doing branches is that I see students oftentimes they do these. You know, they're just like, you know, just snakes all over the place and they're not very natural. 
You see, this is how, how beautiful it is to work on these oil prime canvases. In front of my canvas here, so. Normally what I do is I go season one and stop. And then season two, I start two, three. So I usually go stop, go, stop, go. That's usually the rhythm. So it's like season one, season two, season three, season four. So it's like bump, bump, bump. Now every time you go out, it gets a little smaller. And like I say, when I judge art shows and stuff, I can look at a tree and see whether or not artists have yeah, basic abilities on rendering landscapes. And part of this is just the anatomy of, of a landscape. But you would have a branch go up, season, 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 season. And then branches one, two, three, stop, go, stop, go. Even if you get a little shakes in there, as I'm getting older, my trees are getting more wobular. But uh, uh, again, you can go back over and get a little bit heavier branch. But the main thing is, is that you want to capture this, this thing of stop, go, stop, go. When we're going into these areas in here, you'll notice that I'll kind of pull, pull, stop, pull, stop, and always twisting my fingertips. And don't be afraid to throw some branches out into the blue. You know, you got some dead things. Now with this wet paint here, you can kind of drag some of that out. Just the color that's there as a base. Now, we're going to pretend that the light is coming from the left-hand side. So we're going to lighten this up a little bit over here, just for kicks. I almost got a whole landscape painting here done just in a few minutes, just looking at trees. Okay, so let's just lighten that up and notice every brush stroke should be unique and different. And we've got the base of the trees in, we've got the, the trunks in, kind of a nice little scattered pattern. You want to make sure that you have some um, trunks on top of the foliage of the trees also. Okay, so, not, so that you have tree, uh, limbs and trees in the background. And one thing that I would do before I get too carried away is remember when I started putting in the, the, the edges and softening uh, the edges so that we got the foliage in. You also want to take a lot of those and just blend off the edges. We don't want a lot of hard edges at this point. Uh, again, it, you want the hardest edges on the central focal point. Usually, especially the back part of the tree isn't the central focal point at all. Um, usually the back part of the tree are softer, uh, further away, it's hard for us to focus because really what we're going to be focusing on are the highlights and that's really what we actually see when we see a tree. And if this were an aspen, I would cut in the anatomy of an aspen. This is more like a scrub oak like we have at our ranch. If it's a uh, oak that we see in Texas, then you would uh, pick up the anatomy of that. Um, now we're going to, to take a little bit of the highlight color. The highlight color we're going to use. Now, remember, this color here is the shadow color of blue. And when I said that trees are not really um, green, they're actually variations of, of blue and yellow and brown. So what we're going to do is we're going to take yellow. We're going to add a little bit of blue so we kind of push it into a yellow green. I'm going to add a little bit of white to it just so that it has a little bit of, of light to it so you can see as I put it on. And I'm going to start putting in some of the highlights. Now, the biggest mistake that people have when they start putting in highlights for trees is that they start putting the highlights up on the edges because they think, okay, well, I'm going to work from the outside in. But just like when I started with the base of the tree, I kind of start from the inside out. Even when I started with the, the, the trunks, I always go from the inside out, inside out. Um, one thing that we want to th keep in mind too is that we have branches that come at you and go away from you. So a lot of these branches that are, that are already there, some of the dark parts of those trees, those are actually the back part of the trees. Front part of the trees, I'm going to start right in the front here and I'm going to take a fan brush. I'm just going to go through and start highlighting across the tree, going across the trunk. Same thing here. 
wherever I kind of can get away with it, I want to go across the trunk. Oh, beautiful light. I'm going to throw in some of this light just so it can make it like a beautiful, beautiful daylight. Bob Ross, eat your heart out. Fan brush trees. Now this is a, yeah, these are soft uh, sables that are uh, synthetic. And these brushes here are amazing. Um, they're inexpensive. I talk about them in some of my other videos so that uh, uh, you can probably get a hold of them. But they're, they're really inexpensive and they make beautiful, beautiful trees. Now, I know it seems like very Bob Rossi to be using a fan brush and, and doing this. And we actually look at the old artists in the Hudson River School. They actually painted trees this way too. They actually kind of did the Bob Ross thing. The only difference is, first thing, we're not using a bristle brush like they used. And second, this is a saber brush. What you want to get is that we don't ever use the front of it. Now, if you want to get away from that Bob Ross look, the problem is the reason why it looks like a Bob Ross is that he goes directly on. And when he goes directly on, he ends up with this arch. See that arch there? It's, this is kind of glorified. If I had a big, it would look like that, okay? What I'm doing with my brush right now is I'm using the corner of the brush. So I'm using this side or this side, never the front of it. Notice I'm staying out of the edges as much as I can. I try to stay within. I try to keep the edges of the tree dark uh, for a couple of reasons. One, uh, it just makes the tree stand out. If I get all these light colors up against the tree, it doesn't pop very well. And you always want to make sure that you have uh, values between the skylight and the tree itself. You always want to make sure that you have yeah, different values. Um, as we're looking up tw into, the, into the tree canopy, we're looking up into that. So we're actually looking up into the branches themselves. When we're painting in this center area here, what you want to get that, usually skies is secondary light. So that what we have in the background here, that really bright light that we see in the back. Um, if you hold your hand up to a bright light, what happens is that that gets darker. So if we want to create the feeling of this being a really bright daylight, luminous blue, wonderful sky, we want to make sure that our tree is somewhat dark up against that because naturally it would be. And right now you could just take your hand, hold it up to a window, and you'll notice how much darker your hand will actually be than your arm. Um, so it's an it's a important thing to get the feeling of light. In my Patreon group, we're, we're going in to talking more and more about light and shadows and, and temperature and color and all the good stuff you need to know. We're going to probably do another one of these tree episodes dealing with pine trees because that's a whole nother study. If you want to join my Patreon group and learn more about trees and painting, please do so. If you want more information about coaching, remember that fall workshop is coming up. We also have one in spring, um, third weekend in October. But in the meanwhile, always remember, don't go into your studio unless you're going to change the world. And always remember to paint with passion. I'm Stefan Bauman, and thanks once again for joining the Bauman Effect. Well, that's a lot of good information on how to paint trees, but guess what? There's so much more to that. So there's a part two to making trees where we discuss painting pine trees, look at perspective of trees. So there's a whole nother Bauman Effect coming up here real shortly. If you'd like to get more information about my Patreon, you can do so by going to Patreon Look up Stefan Bauman and get information there. You can go to my website and get a free book, Everything I Know About Painting. And you do that by going to www.stefanbauman.com. And if you'd like to get information about getting coaching, you can do so by getting the information there or just give me a call at 415-606-9074. So until we meet next time, always remember... Don't go into the studio unless you're going to change the world. And always remember to paint with passion. I'm Stefan Bauman. Thanks for tuning in. Have a grand day.